Hey, good morning. I want to talk to you today about a simple word, but in this day and age, a profound word. Uh, we're going to be looking in the book of Exodus and uh, talking through some things that happened there. And uh, as we do that, I'm sure you'll get some insight into how profound this word proximity really is. For, for me as a young father, I used to home from work from time to time. We had three young daughters at the time. And uh, when I'd arrive home in the, into the, through the front door into the house... Um, suddenly, unusually, the house would be quiet, the girls would be well behaved. And from that, I'd found out that uh, Ruth, through the day at some point or another, had mentioned that the girls just needed to wait until their father got home. When I got home, obviously, the girls' behaviour changed dramatically. And it was my proximity to the girls that brought about an adjustment in their behaviour. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only father who's experienced that many of us have. Uh, also, we used to have a dog. Uh, many years ago, it was a little German shepherd. And uh, as a puppy, it's interesting, you know, when you were with the puppy, Goldie was his name, he was, he was fairly well behaved. But when you went out to work and come home in the evening and the clothes were all spread around the backyard, you realised that your lack of proximity to the puppy had a significant difference on its behaviour. He never did it when we were there with him. He only did it when he was outside of our proximity. And I want to talk to you about proximity today because it's a, a profound concept in many ways. Do you know friendships survive or thrive on proximity? Or when friends, uh, you, you know, move to another state or perhaps even move to another country, it's easy to lose connection and contact with them. And those friendships, given enough time, because there's a lack of proximity, they actually begin to change in their flavour and their intimacy. And um, I want to talk to you today, and I'm going to read to you from Exodus chapter 19 to begin with, and we'll talk about this concept. Exodus 19 verse 1 says this, Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Verse 3, then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. What Moses did was put in effort to see God. Now we understand the concept, God was at the top of the mountain and for Moses to meet with God, what he needed to do was climb the mountain, not just a hill, not just a walk in the park, but climb the mountain. He needed to put in effort to meet with God. Now, this is something that is in many ways um, unusual for us today. We, we know that God is everywhere. We understand that theologically. We know that Christ lives within us. We know that the Holy Spirit uh, is leading and guiding us and also lives within us. And so, Putting in effort to meet with God seems like a foreign concept in some ways. But I, can I suggest to you that what we ought to do is put in effort to meet with God. Moses climbed a mountain. It took time, it took energy, it took focus. It meant it was important for him to meet with God and so he put in the effort that was required. When was the last time you put in effort to meet with God? Now I know you may have got up a little bit early one day to meet with him. You may have even spent a little bit of time reading in a, in, in a way to prepare yourself to meet with God. But when did you put in serious effort to meet with him? When was the last time you put in serious effort to meet with him? Think of it. If there's an important person was to uh, want to meet with you, then usually what you would do is put in effort to prepare yourself for that meeting. A local federal member of parliament wants to meet with you over something and perhaps even give you some financial grant. I'm sure you'd put in the effort required to meet with him so that you could, or her, so that you could gain the grant that could be on offer. And yet when it comes to meeting with God, too often I think we skip the effort part and hope for immediate access at a, 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 and quality in that access that exceeds our normal experience. Moses climbed the mountain to meet with God, and I think there's a key for us in doing the same thing. It goes on, the verse of Scripture goes on in verse 3, it says this, The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, I want you to understand 
It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done. God is still calling you. He's crying out for you to meet with him. All you've got to do is respond. Now, I do believe that there are times and points in time where God calls us and effort is required for us to meet with him. It's it's how it works. He's the important one. We're not the important one. He doesn't work on our schedule. We work on his schedule. And there are times where he calls out our name, asking us to meet with him. We're requiring of us time and effort, asking us to leave aside the important things we may be doing so that we can meet with the most important one. Now, God is calling you when he wants to meet with you. My question is, are you hearing his voice? Are you responding to his voice in a way that uh, enables you to meet with him as he desires to? He goes on, uh, getting to the top of the mountain, it says, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob, announce it to the descendants of Israel. Now this particular passage is a, 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 it's replaying what God had said to Moses. But interestingly, the principle still remains. When we get to talk with God, he gives us instruction. You say you want to hear from God, well put in effort and meet with him. And when you do, he will give you instruction on how to live, what to do, what your future plans ought to be. He will give you, if you like, a strategic plan if you're willing to make the time. But it won't happen unless you, unless you put in the effort required to meet with him. God is speaking to Moses and Moses is receiving instruction about how he ought to lead the descendants of Israel. And then God, start of verse 4, Moses receives these strong words from God. He said, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now, we all know from our Bible reading what God did to the Egyptians. There was the multiple plagues that were sent on the Egyptians in an attempt to let the Israelites go free. There was also the loss of the firstborn, not only of their children, but of their, of their stock and everything else. And following all of that, as if that wasn't enough, the Egyptians still were determined to keep control of the Israelites. They, many of them, uh, the Egyptians lost their lives in the Red Sea. As the Red Sea flooded back in, as the Israelites walked through, the seas flooded and the Egyptians lost their life. God addresses Moses and he said, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. This is a a statement of strength. It's a statement of authority. It's a statement, it's almost a threat. And I think what we need to understand, the God that we serve isn't impotent. He he is not unable or uh, lacking in capability. He created the, the, the heavens and the earth. He's created the universe and everything that is within the universe he, he doesn't lack power or authority. And we need to be reminded of the person that we're meeting. We're meeting with the one with, with, with authority to do whatever it is that he desires to do. What we need to do, though, is be ready to respond. He says, you know what I did to the Egyptians. He's making a point to Moses. And I think the same point needs to be made to us. When you know that God is on your side, when he is, he, he is the one with all authority, when you know he's on your side, it gives you greater confidence. I think of, you know, if I'm walking down a a seedy side lane in the center of the city somewhere, if I'm walking by myself, I have to rely on my own strength to get through, and that could be a challenge. But if I'm walking with someone who's got some competency, some strength, some authority, if I'm walking with, say, a policeman, or perhaps, a you know, a martial arts expert, then walking down the seedy lane, walking down a, a place of danger becomes less threatening to me because of whom I'm with. And obviously my confidence grows as a result of that. Moses is receiving these words from God. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. In other words, you are with the one who has all power and all authority. Everything else that causes you fear fades in comparison to the one who has all authority. And God makes this point right from the start. He goes on and he says this, you know how I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. God here is speaking to Moses and reminding him of the fact that not only is he all powerful, 
but he loves continually, consistently. He loves totally and completely. And he carried Moses and he's carried the, uh, the Israelites to a place of safety and he's brought them not only to a place of safety, but he's brought them to a place with himself. He's brought them to a place where they can meet with himself. I just want you to think about that for a moment. God, with all his authority, is able to carry you to a place where not only are you safe, but that you can be with him. Goes on, when you look at verse 5, it says this. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. Now, these words form the basis of Israel's special place in the world economy. We know that God has chosen the Israelites and set them apart, that they're special, that they stand out, that they're his treasure. We understand that even today, they live that same way with that same thought that they're God's special chosen people. But for us, we need to understand what it means to be special and chosen as well. You are God's treasure You ought to feel like you've been separated from the group and that your uniqueness in your relationship with God makes you stand out, like you're a favourite. You know, through the years with our girls as they were growing up, uh, they used to argue about who was my favourite. And I deliberately allowed that to continue because what I wanted them to feel was that each one was my favourite. That, that, that their uniqueness demanded a special part of me that was devoted to them completely and, in other words, separated the others out. But I did that with all four of them so that hopefully they would all feel that I was their favourite. I didn't treat them equally because equal overlooks uniqueness. And what, so what I did was I did my very best to love them uniquely and to make them feel like they were special and set apart. Now they are special and they are set apart and that ought to be the case for every father with his children. But God does that uniquely for all of us. He wants you to feel like you're special, like you're unique, like you stand out. But he can only convey that if you give him time to convey it. He can only um, communicate that to you if you're willing to open your ears and to hear what it is that he's wanting to say to you. You know, the world suffers from low self-esteem. People all around the globe don't know why they've been created, don't know what they're created for, don't know how valuable they really are. We say that our value comes from the fact that Christ loves us. And it's true. The trouble is we know it in our head. We don't necessarily know it in our hearts. I want you to understand God loves you completely. He loves you uniquely. He wants you to feel like he favours you over and above everybody else. That's the sort of relationship he wants you to enter into. That's the sort of feel that he wants you to have. But you'll only get that if you're willing to hear his voice, put in some effort and meet together with him. It goes on in verse, uh, verse 6. It says, You will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses is still on the top of the mountain with God. God is communicating with Moses about a a range of very important and special things. And then as he concludes his discussion with Moses, he says, basically, you're to go back down and you're to tell everybody what I've told you. And in some ways, what I'm trying to do to you today is to tell you you're special, you're unique. And what you need to do is tell the others around you that they're special and that they're unique as well. The God of all the universe, the God with all his power, with all his potential, with all his might, and with all his love and desire and his willingness to draw us near, is trying to communicate to every man and every woman on the earth that they're special, that they're unique. And he wants everyone to know we have a part to play in this. We have a message of grace and hope that we're sharing with the whole world. We're just going to find an opportunity for them to hear the truth about that message. Verse 7 says this, So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer 
back to the Lord. When we genuinely hear from God and communicate to those around us the truth of what he's saying, then it's very likely that people respond positively. It's very likely that they'll respond wholeheartedly. But just as Moses did what was required of him and he acted in obedience, we too need to act in obedience. We need to hear from God, put into action the things that God desires us to put into action, and then go and do the things that we're asked to do, and then following that, go back to him again. Too often what happens is we get our directions, we go and we keep doing things that we think we ought to be doing rather than continuing to do the things that God is saying for us to do. If you don't go back to talk to God about what it is that he's still communicating, then it's unlikely that you'll continue to hear what it is that he's got to say. But the last phrase here is it says, Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Verse 9 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. You may say, well, that doesn't seem right. Why, why is it that the people need to trust Moses? Why is it the people need to trust you or me? The reason they need to trust us be, is because we are a conduit for what it is that God wants to say. And as we communicate with integrity, with honesty, with care and with openness, we have an opportunity of somehow, some way, being a conduit of God's grace and hope and his love to the people all around about us. God will, if you like, use signs and wonders to confirm that what we're saying is true. But ultimately what people need to do is put their trust in what it is that you're saying so that they can in turn put their trust in God. You know, we've just taken a few moments and looked at some brief passages of Scripture today. And my hope is that as a result, you will consider your proximity to God and also your proximity to the people around about you. Both components are important. Jesus spoke about this in, in the New Testament. He said, we're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and I'll love your neighbor as yourself. The challenge is this. Too often, we don't take the time, put in the effort to hear from God. And then secondly, often if we do do that, we don't necessarily apply it in our relationships with one another as we ought. I want to encourage you today. You can make a difference to the people around about you, not with resources, but simply by being a conduit. It requires proximity. It requires proximity with God and proximity with people. And I know we're in a time where proximity from people seems to be abandoned where we're not allowed to touch people, we're not allowed to get close to people. But we can find ways to connect. We can use the phone call to, uh, the, the phones to call. We can use email to connect that way. We can use social media. There are so many ways we can connect with people around about us and now more than ever, they need to hear a message that is simply summed up in these few words. Love your neighbour as yourself. You can make a difference. You've got more time now than ever before to build your proximity with God. Find a time. Let your, vo let your ears hear his voice as he communicates to you. Hear, it, hear what it is that he has got to say and then communicate with the others around about you in a way that they can respond. People will respond if they know that we're speaking on behalf of a God who's communicating through us. I just want to take a moment and I want to pray with you about this thought of proximity. Father, I pray today, may you move by your Holy Spirit as people hear this message, as they consider the implication for their day-to-day -day lives. Will you move by your Holy Spirit in them and through them? Will you speak with them clearly so that as they hear your voice and make a specific time uh, to meet with you, that their lives might be changed and transformed? Father, build hope into them and give them grace. I pray that as they reach out to others around about them, that those others too would be able to hear your voice through the receptacle of our bodies, through the things that we say and through the things that we do, so that their lives too can be transformed. Father, I thank you that your desire is for us to be close to you, that you want to be close to us, that you've chosen us, that we're unique, that we're special, and that Father, as a result of this, we stand up, we stand alone with you, and you you provide that opportunity for every single individual. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.
Great message.